Hey folks, welcome back. So if you're new to my channel, welcome. If you don't know who I am, uh, my nickname is Dag and I am obsessed with model aviation, ultralights, full scale aviation. But if you've been following me for any time at all, you know that my obsession is giant scale electric airplanes. But this particular uh, video is going to be about um, if you want to build an air bike. So I've had probably a half dozen uh, emails where people are like, you know, man, I really want to build an air bike, but I don't know if I have the skills. I don't know if I have the resources. Don't know if I have the money. So could you do a video on what you thought going into building your air bike and what you think now that you're almost at the end of the project? So if you don't know, the air bike it's an ultralight it's a single place ultralight it is a part 103 ultralight which means it's got to be under the 254 pounds and there is a lot to consider um when you buy the drawings and the uh instructions and the books that come with it um uh, because you you've got to be able to work with metal and wood okay the wings are wood and the fuselage is 4130 chrome molly and most people are TIG welding it. Okay, I've had a couple of people say, oh, you can MIG weld it. Well, if you're a really good MIG and you know you're gonna get the penetration right, um, I've seen actually online where some of the air bike fuselages, the 4130 chrome molly welds popped loose and every one of those were MIG weld. I haven't seen a single TIG welded one where something's popped loose on the fuselage and you know, if enough of those chromoly tubes popped loose, then your airframe is going to fail and you're going to die. Before I get too far into this, I want to do a shout out to one of my sponsors. Um, and really, they're more of a partner. I don't want to say they're just a sponsor because um, I use their product. Uh, it's really good stuff. But RTL Fasteners, if you go to their website and buy more than $25 and use the code DAG25, you'll get 25% off. So spend more than $25, you'll get 25% off your order. So I laid out everything here that I've basically acquired in building my air bike. So underneath all of this is the plans that come with it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, on the far left hand book is kind of the assembly book, but it also has a lot of bill of materials and parts descriptions and stuff like that. The little yellow book is kind of the flight manual. It tells you basically how to fly an ultralight. And you should have some pilot experience. I'm a full scale pilot, um, but I haven't really been pilot and commander in over 20 years. So the first flight of this ultralight is gonna be interesting. And yes, I have flown an ultralight before. Um, the Kawasaki is my 340 engine. And there's a whole story on how I finally found the right engine. Um, and that's something you're gonna to have to figure out. Cause if you can't put the right engine in this airplane, it's, it's on a glider. Okay, in the bottom right hand uh, corner is the um, warp drive propeller I bought and I'm gonna do an entire, probably two or three videos just on this propeller because of what I've learned. And I don't know why anybody would ever buy a fixed pitch prop for an ultralight because having a ground adjustable pitch prop gives you so much leeway on the way your exhaust system might be performing. You might not be getting in the RPMs, okay? Um, and if your engine redlines at 6,800 RPM, which mine does, you want to get as close to that power band as possible. And having a ground adjusting um, variable pitch, I mean, ground adjustable pitch that you can adjust the pitch on the ground. I don't know why anybody would ever not do that. Okay. Um, so let's dive into this a little bit. So when you get your plans and you start looking at all this, that, to me, they're pretty good drawings. Okay. But there are some things that if you're not ready for, which I wasn't ready for, because you know I didn't know what I was getting into when I bought this, um, it, it will make you scratch your head because keep in mind, this was originally offered as a kit. So you would buy um, a kit and get a pile of wood. You'd get the fuselage already welded and some parts already prefabbed made. So when you're building this completely from plans, all those prefab parts, you're gonna to have to build yourself. Okay, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. 
But um, I would say the most important thing for you to do if you decide you want to build one of these is buy the drawings in the book. Um, I can't remember how much they are right now. Um, but if you go to, uh, boy, I just forgot the name of that. Jordan Lake's Arrow um, on the internet. They still sell the Arrow bike plans. I think he bought the rights to them. And yes, he has given me permission to show all the drawings and all this stuff. So all of you Karens out there, they're like, I can't believe that you're showing the drawings. Kiss my behind because I've... I, I've got permission to do this. So, but you, you, you need to literally spend months looking at these drawings, taking notes, looking at the books, taking notes. Um, there are bill of materials on the stuff you're gonna have to order for it, like a wood bill of materials and the metal. But there's some prefab parts in here that I'm gonna talk about in a minute that really made me scratch my head. So here is one of the pages of, you know, kind of the bill of materials that come with it. And basically everything that's here is what you're going to have to have or make. Okay. So when you look at just all these different things, I mean, there's quite a bit going on here. And uh, see, here is a, a page where a lot of this stuff was prefabricated or pre-bought or you know, like all the AN bolts that you're going to have to go to Aircraft Spruce and Specialty to get. All of this stuff would have come in parts bags if you bought it as a kit. I don't know if Jordan Lake's Aero still offers the kits and you might want to reach out to them because I know at one time he was and one time he wasn't. I'm not up to date on if he's actually offering the kit for an Aero bike right now, but I built mine 100% from scratch. And... Um, there's going to be some of this stuff is a little bit of a head scratcher that you're going to have to really look at your drawing, identify that part number, look at the book here, identify that part number, and then think about how you're going to cut that part out. So at a minimum, you're going to need a band saw, a scroll saw, you're going to need woodworking tools, okay? Um, there's certain things I've used a lathe for that you wouldn't have to actually own a lathe to make because you could use aluminum tubes that sleeved inside each other and that's the way the drawings are drawn. But there's just certain things about this that made me glad that I've spent 30 years building giant scale radio control airplanes because um, this is not for the novice, okay? But I don't want to scare you away from it. If you're good at woodworking, good at metalworking, I don't want to scare you away from building an air bike, okay? Um, by no means is it impossible. Uh, you might spend a little extra money if you screw up things when you're building it um, and you got to make like another set of widgets or whatever. But, you know, for the most part, you, you're, you're, you're going to have to have some skills, okay? <laughs> and um, then like, you know, here is uh, another list of stuff. Now, one thing that's interesting here is it says wood refers to, the wood word in the drawings refer to southern yellow pine or Douglas fir. The word spruce refers to uh, Sitka spruce or Douglas fir. Now, I got Sitka spruce for all of my ribs, okay, because I wanted the strength and the lightness. But to get the spruce in the sizes I need for the spars, I went with the Douglas fir. And then I used carbon fiber toe to laminate in certain places, which I've done and tested on my giant scale airplanes. Uh, and I know it's going to work. Okay, so I know there's going to be some of you Karens out there going, oh, a giant scale airplane is nothing like an airplane you're going to fly in. You're absolutely wrong. I mean, sure, you can die when you fly in an ultralight, and you're not going to die when you fly a model airplane. But all the principles, all the loads, all the physics, all the stresses, all the geometry is the same. Okay, watch uh, Flight of the Phoenix, uh, the movie where they crash in the desert and the guy who helps them build a monoplane to get out of the desert actually built just model airplanes. Um, and a lot of people who designed real airplanes started designing model airplanes first. So you've heard me speak a couple of times about prefab parts. So this is a strut strap. And basically on the end of the strut, there's two of these that will connect to your wing. And I'm going to do an update on the air bike. And actually I'm going to do a video on an overview of the fuselage and building it, and then an overview of building the wings, and then the miscellaneous, which will be the struts, uh, landing gears, the wheels, junk like that. 
Um, but this right here was a prefab part that would have come in a parts bag if you bought the kit. But, you know, I had to make these myself. So what I did was I went into AutoCAD and I drew it in CAD to scale, printed it one to one, cut these pieces of paper out, use a little bit of that um, 3M77 adhesive, I think that's what it is, lightly sprayed it, put it on the paper, stuck it on the metal, drilled, punched, used my um, metal saw. That's another thing. I said you need a band saw and a scroll saw. You're going to need a metal cutting saw too. And I've got a pretty decent metal cutting saw and grinders, okay? So these are the type of prefab parts you have to build. So here at the bottom of the strut, it shows this, um, well, it says rear, rear strut barrel, that aluminum piece right here. That would have been a prefab part. You're going to have to make that. So what I did, and actually I'm showing the front spar parts, but I just used my lathe, the new 6061 uh, T6. Oh, and another thing is on that page where it talked about um, the spruce and Douglas fir, at the bottom line there, I forgot to mention that, it says, when it says aluminum, everything is 6061 T6. So I made these out of solid aluminum. They're going to be fine. And then... I need to, you need to think about all the jigs you're going to have to make. Okay, all the things are going to hold things together. Now, I built this for my fuselage, and I 3D printed all the parts that would hold the parts in places. But keep in mind, when you 3D print with ABS, you can only tack weld the fuselage together. You can't start welding permanently because you'll get the metal hot and melt all this ABS. Okay, but this is the bottom of my fuselage laying in, in the jig I made. And I think I've got one of the straightest fuselages made for an air bike. Uh, it was really kick-ass doing it like this, folks. But, um, uh, you know, and look, I had stick welded a lot in my life, okay? I had MIG welded a little bit, but I'd never TIG welded. So I did go out and get me um, a TIG welder, spent about 1500 bucks on it. And it's not a great one. It's not like a, one of the Lincoln or the, oh, I'm forgetting all the names of the really good expensive ones. But um, it's not even Milwaukee, is it? God, I, I can't remember the name of the good welders because I can't afford a good welder. Um, but um, the red one, I'm trying to remember who makes the red welders. Oh, well, it does not matter. But um, this is where the Karens came out of the, pay, the, the woodwork again. So I started doing these welds and I was showing them to the public and people just lost their minds. If you ever seen in, uh, uh, I think it's Batman Returns where the Joker just is all freaking out. That's the way all these Karens were freaking out um, about my welds. Now look, I've got a lot of friends in aerospace. Actually one of my Facebook pals built parachutes for some of the rockets that are bringing guys back to earth right now. Um, but my welding friends in my community, one of my aerospace welding friends came over and looked at all my welds and said, these are fabulous welds. Now, I want to warn you something. He asked me, how much argon have you gone through? And I told him I went through like six takes and he's like, oh my God, a really good welder is going to be, be able to weld three times faster than I did. I took my time and you got to be able to see your weld. Okay. I'm not going to teach you how to. TIG weld. There's a million videos on YouTube on how to TIG weld. And I did watch a lot of them. It's a lot of help. People, people make fun of learning from YouTube. YouTube's like its own university right now. If you find the people that are experts on YouTube, you can learn so much from them. So my welding friend said, Dag, your welds are perfect. Um, they even look good. He says, when a weld looks good, it's usually pretty strong. So I felt really good about the welds. Then when I did, went to make my landing gear, I 3D printed these little things to hold all the parts in place for me to tack weld it. Another thing you're going to have to understand that you're going to lose your mind on is all the coping, uh, putting the tubes together and having really tight fits. Um, now, if you end up with anything basically bigger than a 16th of an inch gap, you probably should throw that piece away and regrind a piece that fits tighter. I know you can build in with welding and fill in some gaps, but I wanted mine to be really tight fitting. So I wasted a massive amount of time trying to come up with a way to do these copes. And I know there's a lot of people out there going, oh, they're easy. Just build this thing or buy this thing and do this thing. I tried a lot of it and I just didn't have much success with it. 
my best success was taking the piece of tubing and holding it down to where it's going to go. I whopped it off, put it in my vise, got a grinder, grinded it until a just a loose piece would fit it close. Then I would put it down there. So I went back and forth. I mean, I, w I went as far as just trying to mark what everything was going to be as far as the degrees. And honestly, just going back and eyeballing it and taking my time and cutting it worked the best. Now, I know there's all these machines and all these different ways, and even with my mill that I could have used to go through it, but there's some different size tubing here, and I didn't have the different uh, cutting tools for it. Um, but hell, my, my, my hair bike looks sexy as hell. So even though it took me longer than most people, it's, it's strong and it's good. Horizontal stabs are pretty simple on this. I mean, bending the tubing. Bending smaller chrome molly, I found out, is a little bit of a challenge. So I got me a big um, pipe bender. You can see it under the table there for building, bending like Schedule 40 pipe. And I 3D printed some inserts to go into that that actually worked pretty kick-ass with bending my tubing. Um, I had forgotten how hard it is to bend thin wall, small diameter tubing. Um, the wing, I'm going to do a whole video series on the wing. You just need to know how to have patience, woodworking. There's going to be little gussets you got to cut out. I mean, this wing, I don't want to say the wing's a nightmare because I love building. I absolutely love building. If you don't love building, you don't want to build an air bike. Okay. Building these wings are going to take patience and time. Mine are turning out freaking awesome. Okay. And look, ladies and gentlemen, how do I say this? I always try to create positivity in my videos. Okay, I don't like to ever really put people down. Okay, I don't even—I shouldn't even call them people Karens, but they are. Um, I want you to think about something. Let's say in 1855, somebody built a widget. And today we have much better ways of building that widget. And today we build that widget by today's standards. And somebody comes out of the woodwork and go, that wasn't the way it was designed in 1850. You have to design it exactly the way it was done in 1850. Well, you don't. As long as structurally and mechanically it works right, you're, you're going to be fine. And through my experience, I've pretty much figured out how to, I know I, I I shouldn't say pretty much no uh, or, or think. I know it's going to work, okay? And plus, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of how to say this without getting into being, putting people down, okay? Basically, walk in my shoes and do all the design I've done, all the testing I've done, all the development I've done, and then question what I do, okay? Well, no, actually, I love it when people question it. Just don't tell me I'm wrong without having a conversation, and then you got to figure out what engine you're going to put in this thing. And this was one of the biggest things that almost made me just walk away from the whole project was the pain in the ass with the, everybody's an expert on the engine that should go on an ultralight, but nobody's ever done it. Okay. So originally, if you remember back in the day, I was going to go with a 250 cc um, belt driven uh, motor that comes from the radio control world. But that engine all up only weighed about 28 pounds. And my CG, and this is where I was ignorant, I didn't look at what my CG would be before I bought that engine. So got that engine, and uh, essentially there's no way without hanging the engine out another 36 inches, which would look stupid, almost like a turbine, um, or adding 25 pounds, which you don't want to ever add weight to an airplane, not that much weight to get the CG right. So I thought I was screwed. Well, then a buddy of mine says, well, do you know about the Jaybird guy up in Michigan that builds the Kawasaki engines? I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So the Kawasaki 340 and 440 were made for snowmobiles back in like the 80s. Evidently, those motors aren't made anymore or engines. Um, I've had people send me that motors are electric and engines are gas. I mean, you wouldn't believe the emails I get. So the propulsion system, <coughs> excuse me, for my airplane um, is a 340 Kawasaki. 
So evidently this gentleman knows how to get all the parts and pieces for the E340 and then builds one. And to really be clear here, this is the greatest engine. I've, I've got about an hour on it now uh, testing it. It is strong, it is intimidating. One thing I need to warn you, um, and this created a big, big discussion out there. A two cylinder inline two stroke has what's known as a dead spark. So there's one magneto. So imagine the pistons are doing this, okay? But there's one magneto. So when the piston comes down, fires, this spark plug's firing too. But there's not enough compression, fuel, or anything to be critical mass, or whatever the hell you want to call it, that it doesn't really ignite anything. Now, I talked to a guy who builds these racing two-strokes and have dynoed them and everything, and he says nothing's really going on when that spark happens down there because of the way the fuel pressure and everything's going on there. So it's called a dead spark, okay? Then when this one comes down, this one goes up, this one's the dead spark. But keep in mind, for one revolution, there are two combustions on that two-stroke. So when the engine's turning 6,000 RPM to my ear, it sounds like it's turning 12,000 RPM like a Formula One engine. And that got me when I first tested it. I thought my tachometer was wrong. I thought it was going to blow up my engine. And because it screams, folks. I mean, to be 18 inches from a 56-inch propeller, carbon fiber propeller, and have a motor that sounds like it was turning 12,000 RPM just sound like it's going to blow up. So I took a step back, I talked to the engine manufacturer, I talked to some friends, and one of my buddies just came out and said, hey, wait, wait, Dag, you're used to either hearing a boxer two-stroke or a single cylinder two-stroke. Um, he goes, you're getting two notes or two reports per one revolution. So it does sound like it's screaming its guts out, folks, but it's incredible the power that this engine has. Another thing you're going to have to do, let's say you go with a Kawasaki 340, which I would really recommend you do because this engine is bulletproof. It is just such a sexy engine. It's about 34, 35 horsepower from what people are telling me. It is just a kick-ass engine, but you're going to have to come up with an exhaust system. Now, I believe Jaybird makes an exhaust system that you're going to have to figure out how you're going to mount it to the particular plane you're building. Now, if it's an air bike, you're going to have to work with them to figure out how they're going to make it fit your airframe. I decided to build this 100% from scratch. The only part I bought on this was from Amazon, and it was this spring uh, vibration isolation thing. So when the engine's vibrating, it doesn't break any of my welds. But this part right here and this part right here are held together two big springs. And um, I'm not sure if you could see that in the last picture yeah you can right down here let me go full screen for a minute for you so right down here you can see the two springs okay but the um the exhaust system is really important for these and right now i've got a pretty big outlet on this that i'm going to start shrinking in size until the back pressure gets to the point where i'm producing the best rpms this is not a tuned pipe but you do need a certain amount of back pressure on two strokes to be high performance. Now, <clears throat> I've had people tell me a two stroke won't run without a, um, uh, an exhaust system like this. That's not true. Look at all the chainsaws that you buy. They got that little bitty box exhaust system on it, but they're not high performance. They're just sitting there for a certain torque band on the chainsaw to cut down your tree. Okay. But, I uh, TIG welded this whole thing up, and uh, it has worked flawlessly, folks. Th this, um, I haven't started really closing the exhaust on it yet and see what that does to my RPM. But <clears throat> right now, the engine, I'm my prop set to 16 pitch, which I think the usable pitch is from 6 to 20. I got 16, which means I'm a really high pitch prop right now. I did that to keep my RPM down. At max RPM, I'm at 6,000 RPM. So... I can lower that pitch just a little bit and hit my 6800 red line easy. So I may not even have to alter this exhaust. 
uh, or close that up. Another thing is you need ear protection. The, this thing is loud. I mean, when it's wide open and you're that close to the prop and the exhaust, it is loud. So hopefully this has kind of given you a snapshot <clears throat> into what you're gonna have to think about doing. Um, first of all, patience, okay? You, you're going to, if you decide to do this, get the drawings and study those drawings for a couple of months. Just really get to know them. I don't know if you can hear that noise in the background, but I've got my um, Bernice Mountain Dog on a couch over here that's crying at me because it wants me to, every time it talks, it wants me to be talking to the dog. So if you hear that little bit of whine over there, that's my dog. Um, uh, it's not an air leak in the room or something. But um, if you're going to build one of these, I'm telling you, it'd be one of the most rewarding things you've done. I mean, it's really cool. I was hoping to build my entire plane in a year. And because of the engine setbacks and the confusion on some other things with the airplane uh, and my RC world, you know, I'm not giving up my RC airplanes. I, you know, I posted one video about my air bike and somebody goes, oh, so we're not going to see any more RC updates. No, I'm going to keep doing all of my radio control updates and all of my how to's and all of that, folks. But I am going to have this flying by next spring, no matter what. Okay, um, unless I have a heart attack and die, I'm gonna have this flying in the springtime. And what's really cool is, it's, it's almost done. I mean, I'm getting ready to cut out the ailerons on the wings. Um, that'll be the last things on the wings I gotta do. Uh, the fuselage is basically done. So I'm getting really close to covering the tail feathers and the wings um, and then paint. So, I mean, realistically, this could be done by January, but here in Indiana, I'm not going to be flying it in January. So look, everybody, thanks for so much for the support of, of my channel and liking my videos. Thank you so much for all of the, um, emails I get through my Gmail and I'll try to put my Gmail in the comments here. So if you've got any questions, you can reach out to me. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, folks, this is the cool, I shouldn't say the coolest. This is one of the, this is the top five coolest projects I've ever done in my life because um, I'm going to get a fly in this. You know, I can't afford a brand new 172. I'm not a bazillionaire. Oh, cost. So the engine's going to set you back three to four thousand dollars. The propeller is going to set you back six to eight hundred dollars. Um, all of the 41 chromoly I bought pre-COVID, so I have no idea how expensive it is now. It's probably tripled in price. Uh, but I had about $1,500 or $1,000 of 4130 chromoly. <coughs> Excuse me. All the wood, I had about uh, $600 in wood. Uh, the wheels go to wheelbarrows. So those were bought on Amazon for like virtually nothing. Um... Yeah. Oh, and my, my MIG welder, I spent um, like $1,500 on. TIG welder, my TIG welder, I spent $1,500 on. Uh, and a bottle of Argon's about 80 bucks, I think, and I got the pony bottles, or 60 bucks, something like that. And I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, yeah, all up, you're probably gonna spend six grand, maybe seven on the airplane. I'm guessing, and I should do, I, somewhere I've got an itemized list, so I should do that. So look, I'm going to quit jibber-jabbering here. Thanks again, uh, and if you got any questions, shoot me an email, and have a fabulous day, everybody. Oh, and you know I always end my uh, videos, and I don't have one close to me. Get a kid involved in model aviation. Um, I've been really touting that. And I've gotten a couple of emails where people say, ah, we should forget the kids. We should be targeting the 20 and 30 years olds. <clears throat> well, I went up uh, two days ago to the Academy of Model Aeronautics and met with Tony Steel Stillman, the head of their safety program, and talked about how many new kids were really getting in model aviation, and it's going to blow your mind. So I'm, I am going to start creating a series. I don't know the name of it yet, but it's going to be what the AMA is really doing for us, and it's going to come from an AMA member, not from the AMA. So it's not going to be propaganda or what you might think is propaganda. It's going to be what I like or dislike about the AMA. And right now, there's a lot more I like about the AMA than I dislike. Um, so stay tuned for that. I'm going to try to do the first video here in the next three weeks. And uh, 
yeah, that's it, everybody. Have a fabulous day. Rock on. Be nice to each other and get a kid into model aviation. Okay, if you got time to take them to soccer practice, if you got time to take them to hockey, if you got time to take them to baseball practice, you got time for all of that, great. And if the kid wants to be an athlete that goes to college and finds out he's not going to be in the top 1,000% and become a millionaire and have to go off and probably do, I don't know, used car sales, if they are in model aviation, they have all kinds of different uh, gateways into engineering, science, Heck, they might go into the Air Force, become a fighter pilot, get out of that and go into the astronaut program and be one of the first people to Mars, okay? So if you've got time for your kids to be involved with all these sports, model aviation isn't that much more time or money. I mean, I've got a friend that spends about $1,000 a year on the kids' soccer stuff, and I'm thinking, man, $1,000 for a 10-year-old in RC? Holy cow, you can get all kinds of small park flyers and stuff for that. So I'll see you next time, everybody. And uh, keep in mind, there's going to be two types or three types of updates. Air bike, which is my ultralight. Model aircraft. And then I'll do some of this Academy Model Aeronautics thoughts and things. See you next time, everybody. Be safe. Bye.